wherever you are. I greet you with all the best greeting that you would like to have. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And I wish you a happy life. And I wish you a safe and peaceful life. And I wish you a prosperous life as well. Today we'll be talking about the third part of our talk about the different kinds of families and the needs to establish a social support unit in social and humanitarian organization. In the first part, we talked about the different kinds of families, which in my little experience, I thought they were 11, 12. The second part, we discussed the layers protecting the children inside the families layers or circles and this was last week i received the question from one of my colleague who told me why you divide community by families i said i'm not dividing them i'm trying to put <coughs> this on the table to let the social worker or no, not the social worker the humanitarian worker to understand that there's different families inside each community, inside each society. It's not to differentiate, it's not to promote certain family, it's not to uh, make a distinction between a family and the family, but actually this is to understand that there's a more vulnerable families than others, when they don't have much or many uh, layers to protect the children inside the family or the members inside the family. While we are facing a heavy storm in the south of uh, England today, I'll share with you an experience happened to be after Jum'a prayer or for Friday, Friday prayer. I was going with one of my friends, young man, to buy anti-malaria tablets from one of the uh, pharmacies. And when I went out, stepped out of the car, the wind was so strong, so cold, and nearly he was holding me by the hand because I was nearly going to fall down. I remember the condition of the young men and women and children in Afghanistan in the middle of the winter, snowy winter, or in uh, Syria especially, in Lebanon, and some places in Jordan when it's snowy, windy, and rainy. And I was really uh, shocked by the coldness of the wind and the storm itself. This is today to remember those people in prison, the prisoners, the detainees, the hostages, when they are sleeping on the concrete floor, no heating, no food, no water, no blankets at this very cold weather. There is something for all of us to realize how people are suffering in silence while we are complaining of the less resources that we have, the others have no resources, but they don't complain. Come back to the, our discussion today about the psychosocial support unit. What is made out this unit? I will talk, if, if you want to follow on Zoom, the link is there. If you want to see the other two talks, which is the part one and part two, so the Zoom, has, the link also is there as well. This psychosocial support unit is made out of three components. Component number one is a psychiatrist himself or herself. Component number two is a social worker. Component number three is a project manager or project officer who will be writing the project itself. When I talked about psychiatrist, I'm very clear about what I'm talking about, preferably female, preferably female, to deal with the affected people because most of the affected people 
whether are refugees, displaced, or anywhere, are women and children. That's why I prefer that the psychiatrist should become, should be a female. Not only a female, should also be from maybe the same country, having the same culture, speaking the same language, having the same values, could be having the same religion to understand how serious this psychosocial problem when it affects the individual, whether the children or women or men. So I am discriminating positively and I'm in favor of female psychiatrists. Second component is a social worker, also should be female for the same reasons. Having the same culture, the same values, could be the same religion, the same language and others. Because we cannot bring social worker or psychiatrists who have different culture, different language, different faith, and talk about something which could be trivial for those people from the affected community. Number three is a program manager or program officer who will be writing the project itself and should be also from the affected community. I'm talking today about the affected community, the affected community as well. The social worker, the psychiatrist, and the program officer. And preferably, the first two should be female because they are going to be in direct communication with the affected individuals who are having this psychosocial problem or mental problems. Yes. Why I'm insisting on female psychiatrists or female social worker? Okay. I've got three reasons. Three reasons. Woman's nature. Woman's nature is nurturing, bending, loving, and friendly that can attract affected women and children and even men. So that's why I'm talking as, a, as an individual about woman nature. Allah has given the woman this nature. I don't have it. Not because I'm a bad man, but because this is something I've been given to women, not to men. It's number one. Number two, the confidence of the affected woman and children in another woman, which will make them to open up much more easier than if the sexual worker or the psychiatrist is a male. And let me give you an example, which I mentioned it many times. In 2005 or 2006, we traveled to an area in Kenya called Mandera. All men, bearded. And we were actually in this car, and unfortunately, there was no uh, air conditioning in the car. It was very hot to have to open all the windows. And the soil of the land were actually reddish. So the dust was red and the beard were black. We did not realize how our faces or our beard look like. By the time we reached the place, we were actually trying to talk to women and children. They were so scared, especially the children, because we looked like people who have got red, black, white beard, or gray beard. Like, let, they called us like red devil. And the children were crying, and the women were scared. And they were not very having a comfortable time with us. In 2007, we planned another journey, but with this time, we took three young girls with us. And when we went to Libya, Niger, and Libya, Chad, Niger, Mali, especially in Chad, Niger, and Mali, we found that actually, when the young girls with us actually went to talk to the woman, the children were sitting on the lap of these three girls, happy cracking jokes, smiling. But we remember what happened 
two years before that, or time a year before that, when the children were crying because we look like very masculine, devilish individuals. The third point is the sensitive information. Sometimes a woman does not want to talk about it to a, a man. A child can be scared to open up with a man. I'm not against men, but I'm trying to be realistic, to let the children and the woman to respond naturally to the nature that Allah has put inside the heart of the woman themselves. These are the three reasons why I am insisting and preferring women to men in this business. This department or this unit, what it, what it will do? I've got five functions for this unit. Number one, raising the real situation and their fact-finding mission, fact-finding mission of the problem. Facing these fragmented affected communities. Okay. Number two, preparing practical and therapeutic program to deal with these problems. So they identify the problem, so they make a program for therapeutic uh, program for them. Number three, preparing guidelines for whom? Guidelines and terms of reference for whom? Number one, for the workers themselves. How are going to deal with them? Number two, for the visitors who are coming to see them. Number three, for the donors who sometimes would like to see those people that he or she donate money for. Number four, for uh, volunteers. So they have to prepare this guideline. You know why? Because I had a discussion last week with one of my colleagues, very, very, very well experienced. And she was, she is still working in Yemen in this very difficult situation. And she was telling me, even some of her colleagues have got some mental problems after being there for a few months in Yemen. So they have to be taken out of Yemen to be treated. They have counseling for them. Those are the workers, the humanitarian workers in Yemen, not the affected people of Yemen. She also told me that the children can identify planes only with bombing and rockets and missiles. They never realize that plane could be used for people to travel. And this is how the children look at planes. And this is a problem affecting young kids and affecting different members of the community. This is preparing the guidelines and terms of reference for those officers, volunteers, and even the donors and visitors who are going to deal with these members of the affected communities on local, national, and international level. Number four, preparing therapeutic program for the affected people in point three, as I mentioned them before. You know why? Because you have got psychiatrist, you have got social worker, they have to design the program for the people. I'm welcoming uh, my sister Abir Sauda from Lebanon and my sister Dr. Fariha Khan, which is my teacher from Canada. Welcome. Therapeutic program for the affected people in point three. Number five, being a part of the program team. Yani this psychosocial support unit will have a say in all the programs, whether it's humanitarian, empowerment, developmental, cultural, recreational, educational, advocacy and others, because when the first two talks, we saw about 75 to 85% of the people that we're dealing with have psychosocial problems or some mental problems as well, unfortunately. Next, please.
as I mentioned to you before, we discussed in the part one, the 12 different kinds of families. We discussed in part two, the layers and the circles surrounding the family and protecting the children and the women and the vulnerable people inside the family. It goes from 40 layers to zero layers, because we mentioned families of displacement, displacement refugees, immigrants, uh, widows, uh, orphans, uh, divorcee, street children, uh, and others. And with this different kind of vulnerability, we have to deal with them. And to find, as I mentioned earlier, to you that at least nine of the 12 or 10 of the 12 need psychosocial support. That does not mean that the other two or three does not need it because sometimes a very stable, cohesive family could have a shock or shock the news. So they will need psychosocial support as well. This is besides the rise of different kinds of new families, which could appear in later days and may become legally accepted and protected by the law. Every time, every day, we have new family emerging in our society. Many different types of families could be found in our communities in the near future. The reason I have mentioned these different kinds of families is for inquiring and guidance, not for putting firm solution to what our communities are facing of challenges in various intellectual, scientific, technological, philosophical, moral, value and faith-based, political, economical, educational, upbringing and others just to trying to identify the presence of this family. So please be sure that you're going to deal with them. You know why I'm, I'm now convinced, totally convinced with this unit? Because in the 50s, during the Korean War, in the camps, the doctor was busy examining People with broken arms, legs, bleeding, heart attack, stroke, and others. And young girl, young girl, mid 20 or early 30s, was coming every day, healthy, look healthy, look strong. And doctor would keep telling her, please wait, please wait, please wait, please wait. A few days later, they found her committing suicide. Do you know why? because she have been raped. And the doctor could not be able to physically see something wrong with her, but she could not be able to take it anymore. That's why it becomes now a necessity or a compelling need to have this unit inside the social and humanitarian organization. I was a student when I was qualified as a doctor. I used to be a doctor, but now, alhamdulillah, I'm not. When I was qualified as a medical doctor, my wrong perception on psychiatry and psychiatrist was false and flawed. I thought they were a group of hypnotists. I didn't believe that, in psych I mean that the psychiatry was an important medical field. Nowadays, I confess that we are dealing with 75 to 84% of different kinds of families that living in our community, which need psychosocial support. And we need to empower psychiatrists to do this work. They should have a crucial role in drafting those in the unit, in drafting, writing, editing all social and humanitarian program. Yani organization like uh, multi-million organization like Oxfam or Save the Children or Islamic Leaf or Muslim Hands or Muslim have the resources. 
and others. They can afford to have this unit, to have a psychiatrist, to have a social worker, to have somebody is designing this program. But they have to give them, to empower them, to give them the power to vet on all the program implemented by the organization. There's no excuse anymore. In the Middle East and the MENA region, which is Middle East and North Africa, at least, at least, at least 35 to 40 million internally displaced people between Syria and Yemen and other places. Even still in Iraq, 2 million or less. In this area, only there's about 6 or 7 million Syrian people lived living outside Syria, in Jordan, in Turkey, and in Lebanon. It's a compelling duty on all these organizations to have this cross-cutting specialism to deal with this problem. They should have a crucial role in drafting, writing, and editing all social and humanitarian programs and if this organization have the financial and humanitarian resources, this organization can, can and should build psychosocial support unit or departments in their organization. Next, please. What's my message? My message today is not going to be for young people. It could be for young people as well, but it's going to be for the people in charge of the organization. The people who are living in the ivory tower. The people who think that their organization is the community, or their organization is the society, or the jama'ah is the community, or the society, or the political party is the community or society. No. Their organization is a dot in the ocean of dots which make the society and the community. So my message today is to directed to the board members, the chairmen, or chairman, CEO, chief executive officers, senior directors, and directors of charitable, social, and humanitarian organization. It's like that. Okay. Number A, we have to realize that the community or the society around us is spontaneously growing by the second, by the minute, by the hour, by the day. Spontaneous developmental social growth is always happening without planning. We have nothing to do with it because this is a sunnah of life. And this is the nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in, in the heart and the mind and the creation of his air crea of, 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 uh, of, uh, of his creations. These growth are multidimensional and happening at every direction. Four kinds of growth. Horizontal, which is traditional, which is most of us are very good at traditional growth. We want money, we want money, we want money, fundraise, 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 fund. Very traditional. We don't go out, we don't move out of the fundraise. That's why I call it traditional and horizontal. Vertical, which is intellectual. How can you take the organization from such a level to a level, to higher level, and to B, addressing all the problems inside the society. If you are not intellectually capable to understand what's happening in the surroundings, you will never grow vertically and intellectually. The third kind of growth is intersecting and coexistential. Depending on what? Listen to this. Depending on the provided civil liberty spaces, to each citizen in the society, in the country. It's called intersecting coexistential. If you have this kind of civil liberty space for each individual in the country, we'll have it, we'll grow in this direction. Number four, circumferential and surrounding societies to protect the sector, to protect the society. By whom? By what? by the civil society organization, by the civil society organization, 
by the civil society organization. Civil society organization will be like a protective layer or protecting layer like this. Protecting the individuals, protecting the system, protecting the law, protecting freedom, protecting all this. Circumferential and surrounding societies to protect them through strong, effective, empowered civil society organization and groups enjoying adequately provided civil liberty spaces to, civil, to citizens and organization. These different growth, the four, are always happening, positively or negatively. My message is to the one in charge of the organization, you must, whether you are a male or female, realize and understand that the mechanism leading to this growth and make them important component when developing their organization and such. And you directors, you CEO, you chairman, you board member, you have to realize that there's a spontaneous growth of the society every second, by the day, by the hour, by the minute. And you come out of your ivory tower and understand the speed of growth of the surrounding societies. This is number one, uh, number A. Number B, my, in my message to those uh, in charge of the organization, the magnanimous rise of social problems. The magnanimous rise of social problems by the second, by the day, by the minute, by the hour. And the challenges facing different societies, whether all different kinds of challenges, unemployment, climate change, desertification, uh, conflicts, uh, natural prob natural disaster, all this, all this, all this. And let us realize practically that every citizen, including you, me, and others, had a dream, had a problem, had a project, or had more than one dream. Then you people in charge of this organization, you have to realize that if you have a society or a country having 10 million, 50 million, 100 million, that you have 100 million problems or more, or 1,000, 1,000 problems surrounding you. You cannot isolate yourself from the dreams and aspiration of every citizen in your own society. This will create a huge burden on the people who are managing the social and the humanitarian organization, that if they realize that, if they don't realize that, it's a big, bigger problem. Bigger problem. Number C, the rise of family problems, resulting from different psychosocial problems affecting members of this search. And what I'm talking about now, what we'll see as post Post, post COVID family problem, post COVID societal problem, post COVID economical problem, post COVID maybe intellectual problem, and all this coming after this siege of COVID who put us, all of us, at home for the last two years or more. This is my message to the heads and the chief executives of the organization and the directors. Number four, or the number D, sorry. The rise of what? Armed conflicts. Armed conflicts. Armed conflicts in different parts of the world. For certain, in, in, in Democratic Republic of Congo, more than 75 armed group. I'm not going to talk about it now. Uh, the creation of something called ISIS. And the others, the creation of something called Qaeda, and the others, this kind of armed conflict, conflicts. What's happening in Syria? What's happening in Yemen? And the affected people 
by this conflict in Syria and Yemen. The problem of Uyghur in China, the problem of Rohingya from Myanmar, the problem in Kashmir in India, and in Kashmir itself and others. This is number one. Number two, natural disasters due to climate change. We dare not speak about the causes of climate change because most of the big guys are, are spoiling the climate. Carbon dioxide emission, uh, 55 to 60% of this pollution is coming from three or four countries, including United States of America, China, Russia, and others. But we don't talk about it because we don't want to upset our donors. The problems of mass migration of people, the economic migration, the illegal migration, the people who prefer to die in the middle of the ocean, or the middle of the sea, because they have no future in their country. The rising numbers of economic and illegal immigration, I mentioned it. The rising number of displacement and of refugees in different parts of the world. The rapid change of the local cultures and values leading to lack of the desire of marriage. I'm talking about it because not because I'm somebody from uh, the Stone Age. No, because the most important unit in a society or in a country to build the future is the family. The family will be able to bring the future generation and to nurture the future generation. If we don't have families, we don't have future for our country or our society or our community. The rise of unemployment levels amongst young people. The rise of corruption levels, which badly impacted the social lifestyle of people cross board globally. The overspending, which is very, which is actually in, in the South and the East. Overspending on military expenditure, security expenditure, intelligence expenditures, arms expenditure. You find in certain countries, this expenditure go beyond 70 to 80% of the budget, the national budget. Well, there's no much fund available for social services. Medical, educational, transportation, and others. Particularly if such countries are run and controlled by, by security regime or by military regime or by autocratic regimes. All these and others have led to many, many of these problems mentioned above and more. This leads to the legitimacy of creating these units within the institution to deal with the aggravation, aggravation of these societal problems. The growth and development of associations and the institutions should not keep pace with the further exacerbation of these societal uh, growth. So my conclusion is, which I nearly finished now, it's not a, a long talk like I used to do before. Do we need to build psychosocial support unit in our organization? Yes, we do. Do we need this to be independent? Yes, we do. Do we need its activity to be cross-cutting? Yes, we do. Do we need it to be led by female psychiatrists and social workers? Yes, we do. Do we need to do all this because there's a problem in, the, in, in our society? Yes, we do. Not only a problem, many problems, many problems. So don't make the psychosocial support in a program like a part of a project. It should be a cross-cutting inside the project from A to Z. We are very good in building bricks, stones, but we are not very good in building the souls and the mind and the heart of the people who are going to live inside these stone houses. 
You know why? Because we want to build the house. We want to build the, this, this, this building. It's a fundraising tool to get more money. But when we build my family, it's not a fundraising tool. Nobody can see that I've become a better man, unfortunately. And this come back to the, the, the first, if you can bring back the slide, the Sister Hajar, uh, not this one, the growth, the growth, the growth. That, I, I, I the first one, traditional, no, no, the growth, 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 traditional growth. But after this, after this, after this. Traditional four kinds of growth, one after that, one after that. That's it. That's it. I mentioned four kinds of growth horizontal and traditional. Unfortunately, more than 90% of the organizations are fund driven. Are fund driven. That's why we grow traditionally to catch the fund. But very few of us are vertically and intellectually driven. Yes, I agree with you, Sister Dr. Fariha. I, uh, I would change the name of beneficiaries to call them the rights holders. And the rights holders will be from the very beginning as a part of the, in the process of designing, drafting, reviewing the program. Designing, drafting, which is participatory approach. Thank you, Dr. Fariha, of uh, your comment. So don't come out from your traditional thinking and go to vertical, intellectual, intersecting, conventional and circumferential and surrounding societies. Thank you very much for being with me today. I'm going to miss you for the coming few weeks because inshallah this weekend we're traveling to Ethiopia, then to Kosovo, then to Albania, then to Turkey, inshallah. Make a dua, I'll be communicating with you from there and God bless you. And happy Friday for every one of you. Jum'a wa barakatuh all of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.